I'm going to kick it off. I think we cannot hear you, Zilva. I think you are muted, maybe. Okay, my bad. All right, I'll kick it off. All right, so we created a, uh, our team created our tech talk uh, for 5795. And the reason why we created it was to uh, create a conversation with uh, professionals in the me mechanical field and be able to elaborate on our knowledge and skills and talk to people who use those uh, skills and resources in the professional uh, career field, as opposed to our field, which is more of a com competitive, uh, more amateur style use of uh, these skills. And we wanted to create a conversation where we can uh, present our knowledge in a way that will help us when we are presenting our knowledge during interviews or during competition. So we know what we're talking about. And we also know what we may need uh, in the future as our competition progresses and our season progresses towards refining our robot. And so I guess I will start off with talking about the overall types of mechanical fasteners. Uh, fasteners are hardware devices. You know, they mechanically join or fix objects together. They're typically in structural components. And fasteners are specialized for whatever use. Uh, and the correct fastener serves the correct purpose and make sure that your structural integrity of whatever component or robot you're building is as uh, strong as it can be. An example would be you wouldn't use a nail for a sheet metal because it can slide apart and it won't help in robots when you're building something that uses C channels, you're building a frame, you have to get a correct specialized fastener. So one of the main types of fasteners that are used that we use in robotics are nuts and bolts, uh, you know, bolts being threaded fasteners that can have a variety of use in professional fields such as securing uh, tires onto cars or fastening walls to concrete. Uh, a nut is typically added onto the end of a bolt thread to tighten the two objects together. And they're often used in conjunction together. And we use them in conjunction when we're uh, building a frame for a robot. And it's something we typically use not only because of its structural integrity, but because of the ease of its implementation. And the issue is that some of uh, nuts and bolts also run into problems. Hex nuts and hex bolts often can be loosened with vibrations or force when they're uh, fastening. So because of that, what happens is on a robot that's constantly moving, constantly doing mechanical operations, uh, it can happen and it has happened where a bolt or a nut will become loose and you know compromise the structural integrity of our robot. Not only, not only that, but that kind of force can also strip a nut or bolt and uh, mess with the threads. That makes it harder for us to properly tighten, loosen, or remove nuts and bolts, an issue that we've run into a lot. This uh, tightening or loosening effect that happens over time with high force applied to the nuts and bolts can uh, negatively affect the structural integrity of our robot as well as the efficiency in which it moves because our robots are a lot of moving parts putting together and we want to make sure that uh, parts are moving efficiently in conjunction to each other as well as being held, to held together uh, correctly. So ways to fix these are often adding uh, extra parts in or adding more specialized uh, parts such as Loctite or thread lockers which are an adhesive addition to nuts and bolts that are found in uh, our robots as well as industrial usage. We use uh, Loctite to make sure that our threads are secure and that we don't have to worry about loosening any of our uh, bolts uh, over time as we are using them in practice and in competition. Uh, slotted nuts and cotter pins are useful and they can also be reliable as they lock the nut in place, but drills are often needed and it isn't a very modular or adjustable uh, modification to our uh, fasteners as it does uh, have to be uh, a new hole every time if you want to adjust your parameters for your um, tightness. Uh, another option uh, that is often adjustable are lock nuts that come to a variety of sizes but are uh, accompanied by a nylon band that attaches to the nut and helps keep it in place. However, it does run to the issue of having uh, such a strong connection and a lot of friction means that you don't have the ease of putting it on uh, that quickly, but that can be fixed with washers. Yeah, 
I would like to have. I, I'd like to ask a question uh, on back. Yeah, go back to that slide. Yes. So you're saying these uh, pin locks or, or mechanism to uh, avoid, you know, uh, loosening of the uh, the bolts. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not uh, standard, or they are not as standard available as the nuts and bolts, or they are what a uh, higher price. They can be a higher price, but the main issue is, uh, are you talking about the slotted nuts and the cotter pins? The, yeah, yep, yep, yeah, yes. Uh, the issue that is a lot of times when we are doing a robot for us, we uh, start off with a lot of prototyping. We know an overall, overall design and how we want everything to function. But knowing exact parameters and exact measurements isn't something that we are completely sure of until we put the parts together. And so having a having to drill a hole into a bolt and ensuring that that is the tightness that we want the bolt to stay at isn't something that we run into a lot unless we focus on exact precision of our measurements. Yeah. <coughs> and Until you have finalized your product or what, what do you want to make, you don't want to have the bolt. Okay, I understand. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I can add a little bit. Uh, basically, is not every time we need to use, but, you know, some typical application where you think vibration can lose your nut and maybe you know go out of your joint basically by adding quarter pin uh, what it secure is it will stay with your fastener in this case is a bolt so in it's not like uh, uh, we have cases each and every robot joint but if we see anywhere uh, i think we can utilize this kind of uh, you know, quarter pins to secure, we don't lose that nut, you know. It's it's kind of a knowledge. I don't think we use that much uh, every time. So this is my just uh, two cent, uh, but I see Steve has a raise hand, so if you can add more, yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like the issue you guys are running into is uh, like your torque is breaking on your fasteners. And so you're like by applying Loctite or thread locker, you will, um, you will like be able to retain your bolted joint. Like your nut will not slide off. Um, I feel like where you're probably seeing this problem a lot is near your drivetrain. Uh, I can imagine that that's like producing some pretty high vibrations. Um, and I would also imagine you'd probably see this on your, um, if you have a linear slide design and it's not secured very well, I would I would probably predict that's where you're gonna see, uh, you know, the, the nut coming off, like you're breaking torque at that area. And what you need is a secondary retention mechanism. So by putting a uh, Loctite or thread locker, that is like, that is, a version of a secondary retention mechanism. Basically, all that means is it's making sure that you don't break torque at that joint. What you can also use are these things called lock wire nuts. So they're basically uh, the exact same as like any of these nuts here, but they have a hole in the uh, like external hex feature. Like the that external hexagon will have a hole through it, and you can thread. A wire through there and you can secure that wire to like a nearby nut and what that does is uh, you thread the wire so that it counters the rotation of the nut so if the nut starts to undo itself the wire still holds it in place there uh, if you just look up lock wire nuts and go on like Google image search you'll see some pretty good examples so uh, I don't know if this is like pretty common hardware for you to use, but um, besides Loctite, this is also a good solution. Do you have, do you have, guys have a picture or something of your project where you have faced this problem, or in general? Or um, we have that images will, near that, the that end. will make that will make us uh, understand what problems you are looking at. Um. We do yeah. have images at the end. Uh, yeah, at the end, uh, there are images. Let me try they're to not, find one. They're not exactly like uh, where the problems that we're 
facing on that robot, we're kind of showing where we could possibly use different types of, you know, fasteners or like different nuts or something that we could use and maybe change like the different types or like what we could change in that little bit to maybe better adapt for this year's robot. But there are there are images that we can show where pressure would be or where tension will be on a robot if uh, Zil, you want to quickly jump to some that I think like the best one is the very first image. Yeah, let me... Like that? Yeah, if you see here, there's going to be a lot of uh, tension, right? Especially with the wheels, there's a lot of vibration, there's a lot of uh, torque being put on uh, these fasteners right here. And as you can see, we have multiple lining. Uh, this is, is this 731's robot? Yes. Yes, this is uh, one of our sister team's robots. They mainly use custom uh, plates, but you can see with their fasteners, they have line fasteners all along the plates because of the fact that there's so much torque and vibration going on right at the wheel. And so right into this issue, they uh, added extra uh, tension by uh, not only adding extra fasteners, but also making sure that it's double-sided with uh, two sides of the plate on each part. So not only are they dissipating uh, the vibrations through multiple uh, sides of the wheels, they are adding extra redundancies into their fasteners to make sure that uh, one fastener isn't holding as, or taking over as much of the vibrations as uh, more than it should. So this is a technique that we uh, do a lot. We'll add extra redundancies into our fasteners if we have areas that are more likely to be prone to vibrations. Uh, and as we gain experience, we just know where that would happen, you know, from our first competition on or first uh, drive test, we can see where our robot may be failing in holding itself together. And this is one of the most likely spots for that to happen. Yeah, I think you're at... Uh, Go ahead. I know, I, I was going back, but yeah. Yeah, I was saying uh, I saw a uh, washer uh, being used in the last picture. So there is another kind of washer. You have like spring washer. So that what does what that does is it it you know gives you a little bit of pressure on on the you know uh, bolt bolt or what do you call that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So and it it, it does not let uh, that uh, bolt rotate. And you know, travel from that point uh, outwards. So, mm -hmm. ah, yeah, example of that. I think uh, Raj, they have considered that also. Yeah, this is just, uh, one of the uh, one of the option. But uh, considering timing, uh, keep going. Uh, oh. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so sure. here is a lot of the examples that uh, we have of stuff we use. Uh, a lot of the fasteners or nuts that we use tend to either be. Uh, focus on tension, like we use uh, K-locks and couplings a lot. I, I think that is uh, Zeal, we use the, these the most. And hex, of, yeah. And, and uh, standard hex nuts as uh, well, but it's uh, K-lock, we get a lot of tension on our screws, and so we can uh, we usually put these on. These are the standard ones we use, the K-locks for uh, structural fasteners, and then couplings we use for any extended um, fastening as well. And those would usually be accompanied by our fasteners. Uh, and here we did uh, look at some of the fa common fasteners that we would use, uh, you know, fasteners spreading the load over very surface area. Like you guys said, it can help us uh, make sure our fasteners and our robot is handling the vibrations and torque uh, very well. So we have lock washers and uh, spring washers as well. With spring washers, you know, they would, uh, the locking washers used to prevent vibrations or prevent loosening during vibrations to make sure that a fastener is more secure. With lock washers having a similar effect uh, and helping c combat the, any ex uh, extensive friction that may be on a robot or, uh, around the area where a fastener may be. And so a lot of times I, I think our K lock nuts are accompanied with a type of uh, contact that a spring washer would have. So we get uh, the two-in-one with using K-locks so we can uh, add that extra redundancy for vibrations uh, with our uh, fasteners. But I, there are situations where we add extra fa uh, washers. Usually we use, I think we use lock, locking washers most of the time.
And then uh, the last couple things are we also, not only bolts, uh, in a lot of cases we will also use screws, standard screws. Uh, you know, they're, they're being sharp threaded fasteners that we use for driving mostly into metal, but we also do use plexiglass and uh, in some cases like plastic, CNC, HTP plastic is another uh, material that we use and screws are the best for holding those because as a material, they aren't pre-manufactured to have holes. So a lot of times we uh, drill into them and hold our, uh, and secure our threads with the natural friction of the material. Yeah. And yes, these are the various types of screws that we usually use. I think for us, we mostly either use uh, full bearing or washer faced screws, but we do also have uh, countersunk screws if we needed any flat surface or for any smooth surface. Okay. Yeah, I think Shiv, you have your hand up? Yeah, can you go back to the last slide? Yes. Sir. Yeah, so here, um... I totally understand you want to use screws to like drive a hole through um, through sheet metal, but if the sheet metal you're using isn't being loaded in, uh, like if it's only being loaded in shear, then I think you should be, or, or sorry, if it's not being loaded in shear, then I think you should use rivets instead. You can use things like pop rivets that are pretty simple to install. Um, and you don't have to go through the hassle of like trying to thread sheet metal. Like if the sheet metal you're working with is like, I'd say like less than an inch in thickness, you kind of run into the risk of uh, tearing at the whole location that you drilled mm -hmm. if you try to secure it that way. So I, like a rivet is a pretty simple way to, to keep something. Yeah, like yeah. if you're gonna, go ahead. No, I was gonna say the rivets were the next the next slide actually that okay. was yeah Perfect. rivets are we don't use rivets that much because we also don't use sheet metal the most of the metal we come is in the pre-manufactured uh, parts that like the c channels and such uh a lot of other parts are usually plastic or plexiglass but rivets are mechanical joints that are more permanent you know uh modifying or warping this uh rivet itself to conform to the parts and fasten them together we have had situations where rivets would have worked given the materials, but we uh, mostly geared more towards HTP plastic that we can uh, CNC or uh, plexiglass, which is easier to manipulate as well. But uh, with sheet metal, uh, rivets are usually our go-to when we're planning on using sheet metal. And so these are a really important joint for us. Yeah, I see someone has a hand raised. Yeah, I, I will just add, you know, what uh, CV has mentioned, uh, some rivet is definitely good uh, joint, but is a, as you mentioned, ohm is a permanent, right? We cannot, uh, uh, we have to cut the rivet, right? If you want to do that. So aer aerospace, you see a lot of rivets. In, in our truck application, we don't use rivets a lot. Uh, uh, because, you know, that's the reason sometimes you have to disassemble some component and rivets doesn't give that flexibility. But still we use some specific rivets in our care because rivets sometimes give very good strength in uh, some application. So it's, it's not preferable in some, but uh, in some application, I think Aero and those, it is a very... Uh, like desirable considering the stress and uh, some forces it can bear. So just as a, a, a note saying, you know, rivets is also popular, but we may not be applied direct to us, but industries use a lot. Yeah, um, another thing I would add is I'm not again mechanical, so uh, mechanical engineer, so I do not know much about uh, these, but I would say these I see mostly being used as, as uh, Amit was saying, inside cab. So I see it as where you have, you know, less, uh, how how do you say, uh, less head of the. Uh, if you don't wanna bring it outside the surface, you wanna have something closer to just surface only. So mostly aesthetic wise, it should look 
uh, it should not look like you have a big nut bulging out of the surface. So that's where you would use uh, rivet as well. Am I correct or Amit? <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. No. The rest of the place on the chassis, I, I would see more, uh, you know, big bolts, but not, as you said, on the on the cab itself. No, you are correct. Like if you have a space constraint, right, you know, nut and bolt and uh, uh, your bolt should stick out few threads out of nut. So it is a definitely need more space. So if you have a less space constraint, I think rivet can help you as well. Yeah. Apart from serviceability, you have these aesthetic uh, function and benefit as well if you have rivets. Okay. Okay, um, I'll be discussing the different properties of bolted joints. Okay, so the the first concept I was looking at is what happens when a bolt is tightened. So whenever we turn a bolt, it, that forces the nut to move up an inclined plane, the inclined plane which is on the bolt. Um, and so the torque or like the turning force um, is being used to increase the pressure on the nut, um, which then allows for the nut to climb up the thread. So the relative motion between the nut and the bolt usually attempts to reduce the distance between the bearing surfaces of the bolt um, and the nut. And so the bolt then will begin to stretch like a spring. Um, and then after, uh, because of that, it starts developing tension. And so altogether, this compresses the components together and it creates the all important clamp force. So this is a very, very, you know, uh, bolt or uh, nut and bolt, how it works, right? Uh, because the main, uh, if I understood, whenever we use bolt is, there will be two, either is a plate or two component you want to join together. Mm -hmm. But those two component need clamping force, otherwise there is no way it can combine. So here, I don't think we, we, we know that, but it's important to understand, basically bolt is in tension and it work as a spring, right? So basically, if you see, you stretch a string, which has a, some energy and you put at the end, it will pull such a way, those two plates always come together and not become a loose. So it's it's uh, uh, important to understand here is uh, how tension on the fastener helps to provide the right clamping force, like you see in the image. Uh, but it is a very important slide because that's that is the real benefit from bolted joint on this like image. Oh, yeah, she was just going to drink. Go ahead. Uh, can you go to that first image you showed us? Uh, this one? Wait, uh, one? No, no, no. I think it was like slide 44. Oh, uh, yeah. This one? Yeah, so uh, that's where I think Amit's point is really important here is like um, if you're trying to you have to keep in mind that your drivetrain, your wheels specifically, are supporting the entire load of your robot. So, um, how you how you fasten your like how you fasten your wheels is really important. Um, like, if you're going to be using a bolted joint at this location, then you need to have, like Ahmed said, you need to have two plates that are, you know, I think that can clamp against each other. Um, and I don't really see this at this location. So uh, if you guys have like photos or like a model that you want us to review at the very end, I would be more than happy to kind of like go through and uh, like point stuff out there. But yeah, it was, that was a really good point that was brought up. Is this picture uh, actual picture of your project or? Um, so. This isn't our robot. Um, this is one of our other team's robots that are at our build space. But this was, I think, two, three years ago. Um, we haven't gotten ours fully built yet. Um, 
But when we do, we'll uh, we'll like share with you guys so you can give us like feedback about where we can improve and everything. Would you have wheels like how you're showing in here? Um, yeah, we have similar type of wheels. Um, we're using a different like color or like a different company, but they both are called mechanum wheels, which have like the same type of like building where you have a 45 degree angle on rollers. Yeah. So th does this benefit in your uh, sideways movement or is that what it is or? It's... Yes, that's most of it's used for uh, strafing and doing sideways motion as a lot each of these wheels. So we don't have to worry about turning. We can move the robot in that direction by um, applying uh, contradicting forces right. in terms of uh, front and back direction. So we've used this most because uh, in a three minute window, you know, saving time like that is very much uh, those few seconds matter, especially when you're working on, you know, dealing with uh, elements on the field, like picking stuff up, shooting things, you know, placing things down, being able to move like that helps. So, you know, we can use those, uh, we can use these wheels to help us move around. And so, uh, you know, making sure that our robot can still function with these wheels on is also a big priority. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for answer. Okay. So the next thing is preload force. So when we tie in a belt, there's four main things that happen. So the first one is that we apply torque to the nut, and then that makes the nut turn. And then after that, the bolt will stretch, and then that creates the preload force. So when the uh, the bolt is actually just a spring which stretches and creates um, a preload onto the joint. So the preload force, which is um, also written as F of P, um, is a tension that is caused by tightening the bolt. And that causes the threads to engage and hold the parts together. Um, however, as you tighten the bolt and the nut, uh, you get to a point where the nut won't move any further along the thread. Um, because like there's a part in between um, the nut and bolt. And then our imaginary spring needs to be stretched to get any further movement. Um, so the tightening of the spring stores energy that we can use to hold things together. And lastly, um, the more the bolt is rotated and tightened against the parts in the middle of our nut and bolt, the more the bolt stretches and generates tension with, within the shaft itself. Yes. So I would like to add, you know, preload is a very, very important, you know, you, you, when you go to some key structural member, like any vehicle, uh, they, they calculate a lot of analysis and preload is the one of the important thing. It's basically, you know, as you know, uh, based on your joint, based on your, uh, uh, like two plates, your preload will be different, right? The how much tension you want, need to clamp these two plates together. Uh, so that's uh, like a preload force. And I think we don't know, but that is this is a really most important thing, uh, you know, and use for a lot of calculation. Uh, so it's good to know here, you know, uh, to understand this preload definition at least. Go ahead, Shiv. Yeah, I definitely agree with Amit. Like, the preload force is helping to create. Um, it's it, it's both keeping the two plates together uh, in like in a tensile direction, but also what happens is when you preload that joint, it also holds the two uh, plates together. Uh, under a lot of tensile stress and because there's friction between the two plates it also holds it together in shear stress so the plates won't slip against each other so if you're like you know going back to the question about like or going back to the scenario of having your wheels uh, like support the load of the entire vehicle like you want to kind of work backwards uh, when you're trying to find out what preload force you should be looking for. So you want to find out like, what is the total mass of my vehicle? How much weight does it generate? 
And then from there, you want to find out like, okay, how much, like how much shear force, how much shear stress should I have uh, at this joint location? So the plates don't slip against each other. And then you're able to find out your preload force from that. So um, yeah, like you, like Ahmed said, it's like, it's a lot of analysis, but these are like some simple calculations that will probably help uncover the like very black box, black box nature of like bolted joints and stuff. Like you'll be able to, you know, find out like what size of bolt you should be using, um, like what value should you be torquing your bolts to. So yeah, mm -hmm. ditto on what you said. I, yeah, I'm again. You know, I'm not much qualified, and I do not. I'm not uh, uh, completely familiar with all these terms, uh, preload force or other. Uh, sorry about that, but I think uh, you know when you have these uh, bolt nut and bolt joints, uh, if you have like sheet metal or you know uh, those kind of metal pieces, then definitely you have higher torque values being used, but I, in previous slides, you have mentioned that you have glass fiber kind of stuff uh, if you are making any project. So that would uh, definitely uh, you know, uh, mean that you have some you know, smaller size of screw bolt and nuts and smaller value for torque uh, when you are tightening these. So uh, when uh, some torque calculation will be needed to will need to be done. Uh, when you are, you know, as I think Shiv was, how to decide and do the calculation uh, to this, you know, what nut size you have to use and how much torque value you need to use. It, typically, we will do some validation and testing. And I think your job profile as well says, uh, Shiv, you do that kind of validation. So I think probably you, you are more uh, qualified and me to talk about that so yeah it's like with um depending on what like size bolt you're using um so i'm pretty sure you have like in one of your future slides you'll talk about this but like each bolt has a few different qualities and that's the diameter of the bolt um the thread count the pitch uh like and then if you have a shank or like an unthreaded portion, how long that is. Um, so all these things play into how much load can the board, uh, can the bolt take? And also how much load, like, you know, and that determines like how much load you can actually transmit to uh, like the plates you're holding together. So um, I think online, there's some pretty good like bolted joint calculators. So if, you know, it's like you guys don't need to go deep into the science of like all this stuff. If you want to, that's totally great. But online, there's like bolted joint calculators of, you know, like what size, you know, bolt diameter should I be using? What is the thread count? All that kind of stuff. So it's like you'll be able to find that out pretty quickly. I, I will say one more thing. Um, and Amit, you can definitely like let me know what you think about this as well. But I think you guys should stick to as much standardized fasteners as you can. Like don't try to mix and match and throw in like different things here and there. Like try to stick to like one or two different types of fasteners throughout the vehicle because it'll help you when you're repairing, it'll be pretty quick to do that. Um, also like when you're trying to determine like, you know, what preload you should have all these bolts at and stuff like, if you have something standardized for the whole vehicle, you don't need to be doing a thousand different calculations or something. Like it'll be pretty easy to keep track of, you know, how much force is at this area, how can we repair this area, um, and like it also just for like inventory and building the robot. Like it keeps everything super simple. So what do you think, Amit? No, I completely agree. See here, this is more to get knowledge. But I agree, some application not need like uh, this kind of calculation or specialized faster, right? Some is uh, simple enough. And what you say, availability is also key, right? We can definitely make 
calculation and find out a very precise thing but we should look what is available easily available right one net we can easily replace and put a new net and solve our problem but uh, see overall this is more to knowledge it may not be needed each and every fastener to be like that but something this is a, a background information we know you know what uh, this joint is doing uh, you know in this one gotcha gotcha okay sounds good go ahead zil okay okay so torque so torque is um, what the measurement of the rotational force is applied to an object when the, um, you're tightening a fastener. So torque is usually um, is used to turn a nut onto the bolt, and then that allows to stretch the bolt, making a solid spring, um, which clamps the two materials together. So the bolted materials can't come apart if the clamp load remains more than the tensile load. Um, so when we tighten nuts and fasteners, we have to make sure that we're using the right amount of torque. Um, so torque tightening is the accurate application of torque to a nut, so a bolt that can hold its load securely without breaking. So too little of, and our materials aren't properly tied, tightened, and if we have too much, then um, it can break very easily. Um, yep. So to air here is, you know, torque is a really important. Uh, in, in, in our truck application, uh, you know, we need to specify if you, for your joint, if you want specific torque. So uh, not in detail, but generally in industries, they use low torque, medium torque, and high torque. So high torque is basically, you need to apply with special, uh, this kind of torque wrench. And that means, it's like money, right? You need special uh, instrument to apply torque. So in our application, like truck industries, if we don't specify anything in our drawing or anything, then operator always apply, they call as a medium torque. So there is a charted drawing, you know your fastener, your grade, and it gives you the torque. So they always use that. But for any reason you want to apply specific torque that we in truck, we specify that torque Newton meter and the operator make sure they apply right torque. Uh, so torque is also important and uh, uh, like low torque you can apply medium and high torque you can apply to your joint. Okay, so the torque wrench and torque sequence. So a torque wrench measures torque values. Um, there are several types of torque wrenches. Um, so on the right, you can see there's three that we've shown. Um, but general bolt torque charts give the general torque value for a size and the grade of bolts. Um, so bolt threads should be lubricated for accurate results. Um, and you refer to repair manuals to see if the threads should be lubricated or they should remain dry. Um, and so tightening sequence or tightening patterns ensures that parts secured by several bolts are clamped down evenly. So most of, most of the time, or actually all the time, um, you should go from opposite side to another opposite side and keep on going in that pattern until you have um, every hole um, that you need tightened. Um, and so tighten those uh, fasteners and steps. So you begin by going uh, with the half torque, then you go to a three fourths torque, and then you do the full torque at least twice. Yeah. So have you, you seen this like uh, sequence anywhere? I don't know which there are some practical example, uh, like uh, your car wheel is the typical application for this torque sequence. If you notice carefully, now there are a lot of uh, like torque, uh, big gun come, but if you have to apply uh, uh, like right amount of torque, manually then they they follow this torque sequence and that means they don't apply full torque at a time they go start with 50 percent then they go in sequence maybe one two three four then they the next step they, they increase to 75 percent again do that sequence and the last 
they go through the full torque. So basically where it's very important, right? Uh, torque sequence is used. And I see practical example is your wheel. You know, the car four wheels, uh, uh, they, if somebody manually adding torque, they, they always use this torque wrench as well as torque sequence. Um, okay, all right. So I'm going to cover bolt specifics today for the tech talk. So I guess the first question is what are bolts? And as we covered, a bolt is a mechanical fastener like a screw. However, there are two main types of bolts when you're dealing with fine little details, rough and fine threaded bolts. Each of the two bolts has their own specific uses, such as how fine bolts are used for strength and rough threaded bolts are used for durability. Metric threading. Core starts have a larger pitch, are easier to obtain, and have a wide majority of uses in applications. However, fine met metric threads are more susceptible to galling, a less suitable to high speed assembly as it takes a large time to get your nuts, bolts, and launchers ready, and they need longer thread engagements. So when you're selecting bolts to use, keep both of them in mind. Fine threaded bolts. Fine threaded bolts are used mainly for tension and strength. The helical angle, which is the angle formed uh, between the crest and the, pretty sure it's trough, of each of the threads is very low, allowing for a lot of surface tension, making sure it doesn't loosen when jostled. The tensile strength is higher on a fine threaded bolt, but if it is jostled more, it is way more prone to stripping. Rough threaded bolts. Rough threaded bolts are used for durability. They can undergo thread stripping and are still able to function properly. And the flank engagement is high because of the distance between the threads. And flank engagement is the distance between the thread and the amount of material in between. Bolts and their parts. There are many different kinds of bolts as seen above. Wood screws, machine screws, hex bolts, carriage bolts, lag bolts. However, each bolt has their own specifications, and this image here is very important. Everything matters when considering... Oh, yeah, uh, Shiv, you have a question? Yeah, can you go back to the last slide? So, um, I feel like uh, I should say this, since I think it's kind of like... Uh, it wasn't really well-defined. Um, so far is that the difference between a bolt and a screw is a bolt will have um, it will have an unthreaded shank and that's used for you know like that's used for clearing through like two plates or uh, like it's used for it, it, it's a gap that you'll um, insert the fastener through so it's a really important distinction between a screw and a bolt. And uh, there's like, th there's reasons why we use fasteners versus, there's reasons why we use bolts versus screws at certain areas. Like you don't want to um, have your threads be present in the, uh, like your thread length. You don't want that to be in the gap that the two plates could be at um, that are, like touching at because that's the area that's being or supporting some shear loading and so having a smaller having a smaller diameter uh like joint through that area doesn't help with supporting loading so it just wanted to clear up that distinction they both have like specific uses you can't use you can't always use a screw where a bolt is used and you can't always use a bolt where a screw is used
Okay, thank you for that clarification. All right. Uh, Zia, I think you should go back one. Uh, when using a bullet, you need to consider the kind of threading and the measurements of the bullet. Using the proper bolts can help you cut down on space and run your robot or technology efficiently. The right bolts can leave space for more important things in your robots, such as wiring and other pieces of tech. Overall length. The overall length of the bolt is one of the most important parts as having the right length bolt ensures that your nuts and washers fit without taking up too much space. However, overall length is not thread length. Yeah? So Anis, I, I will add like about a practical experience. Uh, so, you know, uh, in truck, uh, uh, we have like a fastener uh, starting with everything like smaller length fastener, we have a five millimeter increment. So everything start at like uh, 25, 35, 40. And after a certain length, we have increment of 10. So like 50, 60, 70, because, you know, uh, uh, in that way, you know, you optimize your uh, inventory. The key thing is here, the trade engagement, right? In industries, generally, like when they see like, three threads not sticking out of your nut, they don't consider it's a it's a, like a proper joint. So that's why like length is important as well as, you know, when you, you use the bolt, at least minimum three threads should be visible outside of your nut. That's like a thumb rule they use. In that, may, that means you have a proper thread engagement and in a vibration condition, you don't lose the, uh, you know, your nut. So just like since we're mentioning the length, uh, I would like to mention. And I think she mentioned very good point. We call it as a screw or like a fully threaded fastener. Uh, it's not preferable to just use one or other in some typical application. They would like saying uh, consideration rather than you use like fully threaded fastener. Okay. Thank you for explaining that, by the way. All right. So shank length is the tip of the bolt, is the length of the bolt from the tip to the head. And the shank length is crucial when contemplating things such as washers and nuts as they need room to fit on the bolt while leaving enough room uh, for the for the nuts to have any vibration room. All right, thread length is, as it says, it's the length of the threading. This is most important when you're dealing with nuts as you need to make sure that you have enough, they have enough threading for your nut to fit on to have any additional threading in case of vibration and to make sure that it's not too long to the point where your roadblock can't function properly. Shank diameter. Shank diameter is the width of the actual part of the bolt. This is important because you need to make sure that the diameter is the right size for nuts, uh, any materials that you're using in washers because using too small of a bolt can have it jostle around and your parts can loosen. And the shank diameter is the diameter between the threading and not the actual bolt rod. Pitch diameter is the simple effective diameter of a screw or a bolt thread, and it is approximately halfway between the major and minor diameters, the major diameter being the outer length of the threading and the minor diameter being the inner length of the threading. And pitch diameter is used on bolt specifications and is very important to consider when purchasing bolts. A fillet. A fillet on a bolt is a small lip under the head of the bolt. And it's very important that the fillet is not the same size as the head of the bolt as the fillet is used to take any pressure that might break the head of the bolt. And the fillet can stay as a rough jagged shape or it can be rounded up to conform with the head. 
yeah, there's a question. Yeah, so if you go back to the last slide, that's a really good point that you do have to uh, you do have to keep an eye out that your bolted your bolts do have fillets on them. Um, in some cases, like the form of the the joint, like the form of the joint, meaning like how everything stacks up when you assemble uh, the fastener, it may not um, it may not allow for you to have a fillet, but you do want to have a fillet when possible because uh, the way mechanical stress goes through a bolted joint or really any joint um, or really any part is if you have like a rapid change in geometry, meaning like if you like if you think about a bolt head, it's pretty much uh, like it's going from one big outer diameter to like the diameter of the shank. And it looks like, you know, it, it, it's a perpendicular uh, geometry. When you have like such a rapid change in form like that, you will build up stress um, at like the, you'll build up stress between the bolt head and the bolt shank. And so by having the fillet, you'll have like a more gradual change in stress between those two geometries. Um, I don't think you guys will really see like a, a bolt head shanking off in what you guys are doing because it takes a lot to do that. But um, it does happen in like aerospace applications. If you preload, uh, if you preload the bolt to such a point where like the stress is really high between the bolt head and the shank, the two will like break off if you shear load it, meaning you like put some loading on the bolt head on the side. So um, yeah, really important that a fillet is there for like really, really high loading applications. And uh, just to add to you, I think in mechanical, they always tell sharp corner is not good, right? You cannot have any sharp corner. What uh, yeah. <laughs> 290 degrees, that's in anywhere like in plate also, you have a 90 degree cut in a, that's a, not a good design. Yeah. You need to always round that or smoothen that corner. You know, you should not have a sharp corner in any, mm -hmm. any design at all. Yeah. Like airplane windows do not have airplane windows used to be rectangular. And then um, there were a lot of airplane accidents that happened where the cabin over pressurized and, you know, the airplane pretty much exploded. Um, and the issue was if when you have a rectangular window, all those corners are 90 degree angles. So you build up a lot of like a lot of stress in that area because uh, the cabin is pressurized. So they, that's what that's why you see oval windows in all the airplanes now or circular windows is because that way the stress is like uniformly spread uh, on that like geometry. But if you have like a if you have like a rectangle it'll break at the corners. Uh, I like the insight uh, from both of you. I think it's, it's not necessarily like gonna impact us that much, but it's very important knowledge to know. All right. The head height of the bolt is the size of the bolt head. Um, typically some teams from what I've seen, they don't really care too much about head height, but it is very important because a large head, it takes up more space, but you can withstand some more pressure with it. And a small head is, it's kind of the opposite. It doesn't take up as much space, but it can't take up as much pressure either. Yeah. You have a question. Yeah, it's more of a clarification. So head height is really more important for when you're doing like installation, like when you're working with the bolt and you're like m torquing it and everything, you want a certain head height because like, um, like Raj was saying, and like Amit was saying before, sometimes you want your fastener to be really low profile, meaning like on your robot, you don't want... Um, you don't want the bolt head to be sticking out and then contacting like a wheel or contacting like some electronics components. 
so that's why you would use like a smaller profile head height but with um the reason that like some some fasteners have larger head heights than others and they might be the exact same like shank diameter and uh, head diameter is because like it's easier for you to install it and repair and like remove the fastener and everything so it's like something to keep in mind with like that that we do especially in aerospace but like everyone does as well like with uh pretty much every application like you have to think about okay how am i going to actually build like this design like is this going to be easy for someone to get in there with an allen key and torque down or is this going to be pretty difficult because like you know the head height is super super small or the like hex feature is like not the right size or too too small or something so um yeah like th that's another really big probably i'd say the most important reason for why head height changes for for bolt designs uh okay uh thank you for that insight as well uh it does make a lot of sense and i'm pretty sure it will be a very useful uh We've had some problems with head height this morning, actually, in our uh, outreach robot. All right. Um, yeah. OK, TPI. TPI stands for threads per inch, and it's, it's basically a count of the number of threads per inch of the bolt or fastener. But the thing is, TPI is only used with American fasteners, also known as inch or imperial fasteners, and not metric fasteners. Bolt strength. Each bolt has their own tensile strength that is indicated on the head of the bolt. Inch or imperial fasteners use the grade system that involves slash marks on the head. The more slash marks, the stronger uh, the bolt is. Metric fasteners use the class system, which is two numbers separated by a decimal point. The number on the left indicates ultimate strength, and the number on the right is the ratio of yield stress to ultimate strength. If you look at the little picture at the bottom, you can see um, it goes from weakest to strongest left to right. Oh, yeah. If you go back to next slide, last slide here. So this is a very important, not for uh, as you raise, uh, like uh, for our robot, but in lot of joint where, you know, when in truck application, we do lot of analysis, then suppose sometime we see some failure, right? Uh, because of uh, whatever stress uh, in the system or stress on the part, then analysis, our analyst, next away, first question they ask, can you increase the grade? Because by adding the grade, what are you doing? Basically, you improving the strength of the joint. And, and sometimes they ask us to ask us to improve grade of material as well. But many times they see any failure in the bolt. The first question asks, can we change the grade or class? So, you know, grade is more for uh, uh, imperial or inch fastener and class is more for metric fastener but it is widely used uh, whenever you know strength is important uh, just to you know add some point here okay thank you i think uh that's very important especially because uh you know it's just it's something small that can help change the how your robot works entirely. All right. And these are some examples of bolt specification. And with the top one, uh, nominal diameter is essentially the same thing as pitch diameter. So this is essentially the standard for how you will find your bolt measurement. So it's pitch diameter, threads per inch. So your bolt diameter is a quarter of an inch. You have 20 threads per inch. The length is three fourths of an inch and you have your thread series, class fit, material grade, the head type and you know hex head bolt. With metric fasteners, however, 
it's usually signified with M for metric, and then you have your nominal diameter, uh, which is here is 12. You have pitch, which is 1.75. And you also have the class, which is seen as 4.8. Okay, so um, now that we've actually covered quite a bit on um, mechanical fasteners, um, now um, I'm going to discuss um, how we actually translate um, these concepts or like these, you know, varieties of mechanisms into our um, into our project. So um, we already went over this image um, before. In this particular example, as shown um, by the black piece of thunder hex. Um, the two white plates are distinctively connected with the socket head screw along with the washer to maximize that surface area and also the flange hex head screw to um, secure the shaft that the wheel um, rests on. Another example um, of a use case is on our ultimate goal robot from last year. Um, in this particular example, there are two examples of how we use socket head screws. So the one to the top right corner of the screen is um, one of the socket head screws we use to secure one of our U channels. Um, and the one to the toward the bottom left corner is um, the socket head screw which is threaded into one of our hubs that um, later connects to our one of our mechanism wheels and um, as you can probably tell there are two socket head screws on that particular hub and that is to maximize on the capacity in which we can fully tighten on the axle uh, the next example is on our ultimate goal robot um, from last year we have the um, wobble goal grabber and in this particular example as shown towards the left of the picture there's a nylon nut as well as um, bolts which obviously um, hold together the 3d printed part onto the tetrix channel um, this particular like example um, we have to spend a lot of time um, you know modifying that particular mechanism on our robot. And um, over the course of testing, we realized that the nylon nuts provided a much better fit and um, they were much more better than the other counterparts which we had in our build space. Another example of this um, is more or less a modern build system which, you, which we use, um, it's called GoBuilda. And in this example, we have the socket head screw. We have two on either side, and this was used to secure our battery. Um, this metal bracket in particular is what prevented our battery from actually, you know, moving from its original starting position, because um, in order to secure that um, critical piece of a robot. So that's the particular use case for those socket head screws. Um, another really critical example, which we also use um, in this year's um, prototype, which we're currently using, um, are the flathead countersunk screws um, on our Misumi slides. Um, these slides are really, we need to be able to keep a thin profile, and the flathead screws serve that purpose. Um, in addition to just providing structure, we also um, have the 3D printed part, as you can tell, um, based on like the three black inserts, we have these flathead screws which hold the rev bearing in place um, so that one, the bearing can spin um, freely and it is secured um, in its little enclosure. Also off to the left of the picture, next to the green um, 3D printed insert, we have a nut as well as a bolt. Um, the nut in particular secures the, um, the rev bearing um, in place while the bolt provides that extra tension so that we can attach the 3D printed part onto our rev extrusion, which is the black piece of um, metal on the side of the, next to the drawer slide.
Yeah, I think this is uh, the end of our meeting because we scheduled a meeting to end at 4.40, so it's going to finish up soon. But I do want to say thank you for everyone who could come. I know that uh, Mr. Nerala left, but, you know, it was a good talk and a good conversation for us to have. And, you know, it's nice to hear from professional minds, especially, uh, you know, Shiv, you being an alumni for uh, the competition also helps because, you know, we get to have these conversations to better understand our robot.